Tonight on Huckabee, Project Veritas founder James O'Keefe, legendary pop icon Pat Moon, funny man and funny dog Todd Oliver and Irving, the voice winner Todd Tillman. That's Trey Corley in the Music City Connection. And I'm your announcer, Keith Bilbrey. And now, here's Mike Huckabee! Wow, I found something that Trey has actually hit upon. I'm pretty proud of him. He is wearing a Kansas City Chiefs jacket tonight. And uh, my son-in-law, Sarah's husband, is from Kansas City. So guess who we will be rooting for in the Super Bowl? The Chiefs. Yes, we will. Welcome, everybody. we got a great show lined up for you. But, you know, I just need to start, and I've been telling you, it is becoming apparent that Democrats just aren't all excited about Joe Biden running for re-election. They're not. And it's also clear they aren't sure that he can go the distance in his first term. I mean, his mumbling and fumbling and bumbling, his every utterance, is alternating between yelling and then using a stage whisper. (laughs) And having to constantly remind us that what he's saying is not a joke. Because frankly, what he says sometimes sounds like a joke. It's a joke, but... Uh, not a joke. I'm not joking. No, I really mean that. I'm not joking now. For real. You think I'm joking. I'm not joking. Not a joke. Fact. Not a joke. Fact. Not a joke. Not a joke. No, no, think about it. I'm not joking. <laughs> not joking here. No, no, not joking. But as cringeworthy as it is to watch the President of the United States shake hands with a ghost after his speeches or get led away by staffers dressed as the Easter Bunny, I tell you, the Democrats have an equally big challenge on their hands, and it's the person who has been said who's just one 80-year-old heartbeat away from the presidency. I'm talking, of course, about Kamala Harris, (laughs) whose word salads and her gaffes make her boss look like the child of William Shakespeare and John F. Kennedy, for heaven's sakes. I mean, just recently, the vice president tried to tell us what was in the Declaration of Independence as she promoted abortion and pretended that killing a baby in the womb is actually a form of health care and is as much a constitutional right as going to church or writing a letter to the editor. Watch. That we are each endowed with the right to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Hmm, did she appear to miss something here? Maybe just a little something? I couldn't help but notice that the phrase she seemed to be quoting was this one. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Was that what she was trying to say? Hmm. Madam Vice President, it seems that you left off a couple of things that are pretty important. That the first unalienable right is that of life. But if she'd actually said that, that we have a right to life, then that would surely sound pro-life. And no modern socialist-leaning, climate-worshipping, gender-confused, economically ignorant Democrat leader would ever say that. No way. Uh Uh-uh. So, she just left that part out and assumed that none of us would ever know the difference. And then when she spoke of these being rights that we have, that we're endowed with, she kind of forgot to mention that the endowment came from our creator, not the government, from our creator. Now, I wish her ridiculous speech praising abortion was a one-off, but as they say on TV commercials, But wait, there's more. Sometimes she picks a phrase and just repeats it in the very same sentence, as if somehow it will cause the nonsensical to make sense. 
talking about the significance of the passage of time, right? The significance of the passage of time. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time in terms of what we need to do. Something about the passage of time. <laughs> but she wants us to work together. Which is why we will work together and continue to work together to address these issues, to tackle these challenges, and to work together as we continue to work operating from the new norms, rules, and agreements that we will convene to work together on. I, I think she wants us to work together somehow in there. And of course, no Kamala Harris speech would be complete without a pitch for equity, whatever that means. So equity as a concept says, recognize that everyone has the same capacity, but in order for them to have equal opportunity to reach that capacity, what we must pay attention to this issue of equity. Mm-hmm, yeah. Everybody's got the same capacity. That's why next year I'm gonna be quarterbacking the Dallas Cowboys to their first Super Bowl in 100 years. That's what's gonna happen. Yeah. Why not? If that's equity, my goodness, most of us will never experience it. Now, just remember, if she were to become president, then she would be in charge of foreign policy as well as being our current border czar. Hey, look, she spent more time at Borders Books and on the border Mexican restaurant than at the southern border. But in addition to standing at the 38th parallel and confusing North Korea with South Korea, she also f seems to just not understand that Ukraine is not a member of NATO. The United States stands firmly with the Ukrainian people in defense of the NATO alliance. You know, there are more, and I mean many, many more. But you get the point. To be blunt, the Democrats haven't really fielded a Super Bowl team for 2024. I'm sure they'll end up with a roster of people wanting the job, but the criteria might need to include just a basic understanding of history, the Constitution, geography, fundamental math, and just for good measure, at the very least, a grade school capacity to understand right and speak the English language. Well, according to some people, my next guest is an American political activist and provocateur who founded Project Veritas. And they say he's a far right guy with an activist group that uses deceptive editing techniques to attack mainstream media organizations and progressive groups. The truth, Project Veritas does investigative journalism that exposes the elite and far left for what they really are. And boy, do they hate it. The latest video series from Project Veritas has racked up over 45 million views on Twitter in just the last week. And it's been censored just about everywhere else. It's prompted a frantic response from one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Would you please welcome back to the show founder and CEO of Project Veritas, James O'Keefe. <laughs> James, welcome back to one of the places where you are actually loved and respected. Uh, it's not true for most talk shows, right? <laughs> well, not like New Jersey and New York, I guess, right? Uh, not like that at all. What a week you've had. Uh, you've had two major disclosures of uh, interview with a Pfizer pharmaceutical executive. And it's been explosive. Summarize for us what you really have been able to I guess, inform the American people about. Well, this is a, an undercover investigation into Pfizer, uh, a director at the organization who was caught on a hidden camera, and he was talking about how they may be mutating the virus, and he doesn't want anybody to know 
that Pfizer is doing this, and he says that it would be bad for the American people, but good for Pfizer. He repeatedly says, we don't want anybody to know. So this video is the most watched video in Project Veritas history, like you said, 45, 45 million. In a week, that's in, what we got to- In one week. In one week. In one week. This is, a, this is a massive, massive story, perhaps one of the biggest stories ever because it affects everyone. It's gone global. Yeah. Um, and uh, in the American media has not really covered it. The legacy media won't touch it. Well, and that's what I was going to ask. Uh, how many minutes has CBS, ABC, NBC given to this story? Because it is a huge story. Well, as we say at Project Veritas, they are brought to you by Pfizer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a commercial imperative that dominates major media, and there tends to be a nexus there that I think prevents the major media from covering stories like this. Pfizer did put out a statement on Friday night, and they didn't deny our revelations. They didn't deny this man worked for him. In fact, we obtained documents within Pfizer showing that Jordan Walker works for Pfizer, but media refuses to sort of ask the questions and do the reporting. So they just don't cover it, but 40 million people have watched the video. But when it gets out in the news, it's not that they wanna cover what you were able to expose. They always want to say, but his methods, right. his methods were unethical. So let's talk about your methods. These are people who cough up this information to you. How do you go about getting somebody to say the things that are as truthful as they seem to be, and they're saying it out of their own mouth? Um, how's that happen? Well, first of all, they don't know that they're being recorded, and they don't know that the person they're talking to is a journalist. And, and traditionally, in journalism, you identify yourself, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Jones from the Washington Post. Yeah. But people are not going to be honest with you if you do that. So we, we use hidden cameras. We build rapport with these subjects. We sit, take a few meetings with them. Sometimes we meet them on the streets. Sometimes we meet them at conferences. We meet them online. Um, sometimes we get a tip. Sometimes we have a whistleblower. Um, and like we had in this story, where people on the inside give us information that helps corroborate the story. This is what investigative reporters do. But something happened in journalism in the last 30 to 40 years. And it used to be that people would sort of run towards the powerful with a camera or with like yeah. Mike Wallace before I was born with yeah. the microphone. But now it seems like the legacy media represents the people in power and run towards all of you, distributing their message to you. So it's all been so twisted. So the only way to untwist it is to utilize these techniques so that we can see the truth, not just through anonymous sources or according to people familiar with the situation, you can see the guy's lips moving when he says it. So when you confronted uh, Dr. Walker, an employee of Pfizer, uh, and this first came out, he was not exactly happy about this. You could, is that an understatement? Understatement of the century. Yeah. This is one of the most riveting and extraordinary things you'll ever see. That video has 15 million views or so. And um, he, I, I walk into the, the pizza restaurant. I sit down. Remember the old Chris Hansen to catch a predator stuff? Yeah. Well, I sat down. I said, is this seat taken? He gets up. He says, I'm, he says, I'm literally a liar. So he's telling me that he's lying, but he's asking me to believe him in that moment that he's telling the truth. <laughs> and then he attacks the iPad that has the videos on it. He starts smashing the iPad on the ground, assaults the camera crew, and calls the NYPD and then the owners of the restaurant lock the doors with us inside, which arguably is a, some type of false imprisonment, before they unlock the doors and we leave. This is an amazing video, but yeah. it shows that he's caught and he doesn't like the fact that he's caught and he got violent. What has Pfizer said? You, as you said before, they didn't deny that he worked for them. Are they saying, look, everything he said is just nonsense? They made some admissions. It was a, um, a kind of an admission, although it was sort of buried in gobbledygook, but you could see it in there in the text of the, of the statement they put out. And then 30 minutes after that, YouTube takes down the video. YouTube takes down the video, and they, YouTube, which is owned by Google, yeah. um, says that there's some misinformation in the video that violates uh, WHO and scientific guidelines. And, and, and I wasn't making any claims in this video. I'm quoting yeah. the Pfizer guy. This is their own guy talking about this. It's stuff. not my, they're going to say it's James O'Keefe's claim. Project Veritas doesn't make any claims. Yeah. We report things um, in an extraordinarily transparent way because you can see the people's faces. You're not asking, we don't ask you to trust me. You show it. But they focus on the techniques because that's the only thing they can focus on. There's, there's no 
The story is so bulletproof that they have to attack the messenger. Well, I want to get into some of the things that were revealed in those conversations with Dr. Jordan Walker, because it is just really frightening for all of us. Tell you, I could talk to James for hours. It's a good thing we're going to keep him here after the break. We'll be right back. Weird news you may have missed is still ahead. And the winner of The Voice, Todd Tillman performs. You're watching Huckabee. MikeHuckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at GovMikeHuckabee on Twitter. Welcome back. We've been visiting with the founder and CEO of Project Veritas, James O'Keefe. James, thanks for staying with us. Before the break, I said, I want to get into some of the things that he revealed to you. This is not stuff that you said. This is stuff he said. And some of it was, it was stunning that they have some concerns at Pfizer. This is what he revealed, that there are some medical uh, conditions long-term that are related to the vaccine. What are some of those that he talked about? Well, I mean, the most recent video, we talked about uh, women's fertility being affected by the vaccine and very concerned about that. This guy was mRNA scientific planning expert. This is no low-level employee. Yeah. This guy's a Yale educated. He's got his doctorate. He's three le steps below the CEO of the company. He's talking about mutating the virus. He's talking about, we don't want anybody to know that we're doing that so we can develop the new, a new virus um, uh, and combat what's going on. He talks about experimenting on animals, which I found very uh, unusual because I wonder where PETA is. Yeah. Uh, putting the virus in monkeys and having them infect other monkeys. And he says that this is all very good for, for Pfizer and very bad for America. That was interesting. I, I saw that quote, and I had to read it two or three times to make sure that I understood right. Good for Pfizer, bad for the And that's American what the story is really about. It's about deception. Because I'm, yeah. I'm not a scientist, and I don't claim to have a position on any of this. I'm my job is to expose liars, cheats, and thieves. Yeah. And if these are the people that are running our, uh, our medical scientific communities in this country, I mean, the, as, as uh, Dr. Malone said, the gentleman seems to have no moral compass whatsoever. And it's all sort of revealed on video. I think all of us understand that when we take any kind of medication, whether it's uh, something as new as the COVID vaccine or whether it's something that's been around a while, there are certain risks that we take. And it's one of those risks that we make an informed decision about, we talk to our doctor, and he may say, look, I don't know that the medicine is perfectly safe, but this medicine may save your life, so you decide and, and which is worse. But there are times when the cure becomes worse than the malady. What he was telling your undercover reporter was that there were things they knew and they were going into what is commonly called gain-of-function research, right. where they're trying to figure out what happens if. That's a scary term that we've been hearing about Wuhan. What you revealed through this video was that's happening here. And he called it something other than gain-of-function. So what, what, what was his... He called it directed evolution. Okay. And, I, and this is something we've seen at Project Veritas, where subjects tend to change the language of what they're doing. And they think that by changing the terminology, that they can change the substance of what they're doing. Although many doctors have reported in this, on this video, Dr. Malone, including him, have said, well, that is gain of function. Um, uh, so, but, and we did a story in Georgia you know, last month where the guy says, as long as I don't call it critical race theory, I can still do it if I call it something else. So, yeah. so this Pfizer executive called it directed evolution, which was the hashtag that we used in the video. Which is, which, is, which is, again, if Pfizer wants to do these things, my, my, my belief is they should just be honest to, their, to the customers yeah. so that everyone knows what they're getting them. It's the dishonesty that I don't like, and it's the dishonesty that makes this such a massive story. And the fact that, the fact that no American media is covering this, is, except, I mean, here, you guys yeah. are covering it, but no, no CBS, NBC, ABC, I mean, Forbes, a Forbes writer wrote an article attacking Project Veritas, and it turns out this guy was somehow affiliated with Pfizer. So 
Um, it's a sacred cow, and that's why what Project Veritas does is so important because we show people the reality, and 45 million people have watched the video. That's a lot of people. I think we're changing people's perceptions of the world around them. James, what you do is an incredible service to the people of America and the world to reveal uh, what a lot of the legacy media is afraid to even go near. And I think I speak for all of us saying thank you very, very much. Now for our audience, I have a feeling you're gonna to wanna to learn more and see more of the undercover videos that Project Veritas has done. We have all the links for you over at Huckabee.tv, plus how to keep up with James O'Keefe on social media. Now you may not know this, but Keith Bilbrey has gone undercover in order to discover what we have coming up on this show. We'll see if he's been able to ferret out the truth. Oh, you're going to love it. It's time for the week's funniest news on In Case You Missed It. That's next on Huckabee. You know, we love the music that we get to hear here in the theater during the show that is provided by the one and only and the best band in the land, Trey Corley, and the Music City Connection. Yes. Thank you, sir. The best. You know, I've told you about the steps of the Apostle Paul Mediterranean Cruise that I'm going to be leading October the 29th through November the 7th of this year aboard a luxury cruise ship with special guests Larry Gatlin, Shonda Pierce, and many others. We got the entire ship just for our group. So if you've been wanting to travel again with a group of like-minded people and have a whole lot of fun, go to thegreateststrip.com and sign up and go with me. Once the limited number of cabins are reserved, the opportunity closes, so go quickly. Well, from mammoth meat to fire ants, we've got the news that'll ruin your dinner on this version of In Case You Missed It. The Travelodge chain in Great Britain compiled a list of the weirdest things that guests left behind in their hotel rooms. Like a seagull. A seagull? A seagull. Who leaves a seagull in a hotel? I, I don't know. Who takes a seagull around to a hotel anyway? How do you get it through the lobby? I, I don't mean. know. <laughs> anyway, here's another one. A six-foot-long Chinese dragon. You know, I'm always forgetting mine when I travel. Yeah. I guess it's one of those things. Yeah. I've another one, fancy. Some, yeah. Another one they left behind was an oil painting of Queen Elizabeth II. Wow. Because, I mean, all Britons travel with one of those. I'm well, sure. sure. Yeah. Also... Uh, a pair of puppies were left behind. The puppies were named J-Lo and Ben. <laughs> oh. Oh. There was a pair of Segway scooters left behind in the hotel room. And here's one I don't get. A pair of donkeys. A pair of donkeys. Uh, again, Don how did they how get is, in the room? Yeah, really. It's like nobody at the desk watching uh. when the donkeys are hauled up to a room. I just guess those people couldn't afford scooters. I don't uh, know. That's why they, they had probably the said, "Oh, we're doing a nativity scene somewhere." I, maybe and, that's it. I anyway, I hope they tip the maid well. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, a soccer team theme wedding cake. The bride did not get a kick out of that. For oh. sure. <laughs> now here is the weirdest part: when the hotel workers cut into the cake, do you know what they found inside? I can't wait. More Joe Biden classified documents. Oh, that's what they found. I knew it was coming. Yep. Next stop is Japan, where a man fell asleep in a massage chair after an appliance store. The employees didn't notice him, and they closed the store for the night. This guy woke up to discover that he was all alone and locked in. So what did he do? He tweeted for help, and police called the store manager to let him out. But here's what I don't understand, Keith. Here's a man, okay? He's in a massage chair with nobody around to bother him, and he wanted to leave? I can't understand what? that. 
I mean, he should have tweeted for a psychiatrist at that point. <laughs> well, these days, someone's always finding something new to be offended by. There is a change.org petition that has drawn almost 164,000 signatures. It demands that we change the name Fire Ants to Spicy Boys. Spicy Boys. <laughs> I guess Fire Ants is offensive to ants. But, but why? I, I don't I've know. never heard one complain. And, and why I'm stop just, there? Yeah. Let's call the Fire Ant Queens Spice Girls, right? <laughs> And we can call bees buzzy boys. Yeah. Wow. And of course, the queen bee can call, be called bee anse. Wow. <laughs> Didn't say it was good. I just... Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Nothing. Finally, our video of the week comes from Australia, where someone in a McDonald's drive through took video of a car in the next lane that had a horse in the back seat of the car. And you oh, wow. thought Keith's car was messy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, the driver said the horse was excited for his ice cream. Turns out he is a regular galloping gourmet there. That's what he is. Oh. And do you know why he really likes ice cream? Why? Because it feels good on his throat. Because he's a little horse. Oh. All right. Okay. Well, before these jokes give you the trots, we'll end it there. (laughs) (laughs) Please. But until next time, remember, we read the news. So you Well, up next, show business legend Pat Boone right here. Then Todd Oliver and Irving are back for some laughs. That's still ahead on Huckabee. Samaritan's Purse is in Alabama, providing relief for those impacted by the devastating tornadoes that ripped through many homes and businesses. Now, this is only possible because of your generosity and the desire to share the great news of Christ in a desperate and hurting world. If you've not done it already, I hope you'll consider supporting the great work of Samaritan's Purse by going to their website, SamaritansPurse.org, or calling them today. Thanks, and God bless you for helping your fellow Americans. Well, I am so excited to have a true icon of American music and entertainment with us today, Pat Boone. Pat has been, yes, it is the reaction that we just spontaneously give because Pat's been entertaining us for 70 years, and he's got a lot of stories to tell, and he does it in his typical smiling fashion in this new book, which may be one of the most important books that's on the market right now. And it's called (laughs) If, The Eternal Choice We All Must Make. A true American original. I can't wait to dive into his life and experiences. Welcome back to the show, the one and only Pat Boone. Yes. You know what, Pat? Hello, Governor. Hello, Pat. I'm still blown away by the fact that you are going strong, writing books, playing golf, doing movies, doing albums, producing and singing at the ripe old age of 88 88. years old. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. Really unbelievable. I mean, God's left you here for a purpose. Yeah. One of which was to write this book. You told me something about this book. I'd never heard it. And I... Be honest, I mean, I've been going to church since I was a little kid. Yeah. Never heard a sermon on this. That no. the word if is one of the most important words. It Why is, the, is that word? The most important word in the, in the Bible is that little two-letter word if. It's in there 500 times more than anything except and and to. The Lord showed me a couple of years ago, and, and I had to write the book, and I didn't want to. Yeah. Because it's a direct book. Uh, telling people the way it is, and people don't really want to know always the way it is. As you notice, I say on the cover, it's not religious, but down at the bottom, I say it's the eternal choice you all must make. If is, is the most used word in the Bible, not one blessing of God doesn't come with an if. Most people don't know that, but yeah. at the, in the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, everything was absolutely perfect. God gave one one law, one command, 
Don't eat that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you die. Mm. They did, they died. And from there on, you can't find the blessing. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have what? Perish. But what do you mean perish? Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The if is, if you don't receive him, yeah. you perish. And nobody wants to talk about that. No, even preachers today don't want to preach that. But the if, now all the way to the book of Revelation, the, where all the churches are established, including the ones you're going to visit on your tour. And I just visited this last year with the Green family on this yeah. fabulous ship. But I wanted to go, I wanted to see the churches that Paul had established in his missionary journeys, and I did. Mm. But also the ones in the book of Revelation, established churches with Jesus is commending through John the Revelator in the book of Revelation. In some cases, some of you are good, but you have sort of lost your first love. But there's other churches that were established churches. He said, you're so lukewarm. I want to spit you out of my mouth. Hmm. I mean, and I mean, we got to wake up. We've got yeah. to start getting back to the word itself because, but I love the Revelation, uh, Revelation, uh, 320, after he denounces the church in Laodicea that I did visit while I was in there in, in Turkey and, and, uh, and Greece, uh, is 320, when she says, I'd stand at the door and knock. If hmm. you'll just open the door, I will come in and dine with you. And once again, he says, if. Yeah, if again. Yeah. If again, if, 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 throughout the whole Bible, it's the most important word because God wants us to have everything that he has created and wants us, if we will choose him. If we don't make the choice, that's why it's on the cover of the book. Pat, you have had one of the most influential lives, not only as a Christian believer, but as an entertainer. And throughout all of these 70 plus years of doing what you've done, you've done it without scandal. You've done it by maintaining your testimony. I mean, that in itself is, is dull is a magnificent, no, it's not dull. I'm, it I, is wonderful. I couldn't resist. I, <laughs> it's not dull. No, it certainly has it's, not been. It's incredibly it's dynamic. It's been an adventure and it hasn't been easy either. But you know, I, I'm sure there were temptations to you oh, just like there were to anybody. Yeah, but I was you once were, a teen idol. You know, and I just can't imagine, but selling 50, 60 million records over the course of your life, number 16 in all time record sales of anybody in the history of the world. That's pretty big deal. Yeah. Well, I hope people will get the book. It's uh, so important, that book, because it is, I'm, I'm pleading with people that I don't know, but I love you all. And I just, I want to talk to Bill Maher, uh, who is so yeah. anti-religion. Yep. And I say on the cover of the book, it's not religious, but it is life or death. Mm. It's relationship with the creator of all things who wants to be our father and wants us to be his children. And you and I, we've lived knowing this. We have been blessed in our lives because God has blessed us. And, and we look to him even when we stumble and make mistakes. We know like a loving dad, he's going to put his arm around us mm. and say, okay, you can do better next time. I forgive you if you don't do that anymore. <laughs> you, but if, 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 it's always if, it's up to us. It's a powerful, powerful message. Now, if you want to keep up with all the things that Pat Boone is interested in and involved in, and there's a lot of it, get this new book, If, The Eternal Choice We All Must Make, or watch Pat's movie, The Mulligan. Yeah. We'll tell you all about how to connect to Pat's projects at Huckabee.tv. Right now, Keith is going to see if you can tell us what's coming up without pulling a mulligan. Keith, let's see if you can do it. <laughs> well, I'll try. Get ready to laugh with Todd Oliver and his talking dog, Irving. And later, the voice winner, Todd Tillman, performs. You're watching Huckabee. Coming
Huckabee.tv and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. If you regularly watch our show, and I sure hope you do, you know that I am a sucker for anything involving dogs. Well, our next act has entertained people all over the world and on TV shows like this one, plus the Today Show, The Tonight Show, David Letterman, America's Got Talent, and many more. When he was on America's Got Talent, they were the top four finalists. I want you to welcome back to our show, Todd Oliver and his amazing talking dog, Irving. Oh, that's a good boy. Well, hi, if you love dogs, let me hear you say woof. woof. Well, then you'll love my dog. This is Irving. He's a terrier. He's six years old. He's very talented. I think you'll like him. Irving, you want to say hello? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Can you acknowledge... <laughs> Can you acknowledge the audience? Mm, looks like old people and their parents. <laughs> I'm sorry he didn't say that. I know you did, I just doing the mouth. <laughs> How can these guys laugh when I talk? Because dogs usually bark. Yeah, the dumb ones. <laughs> Why are they dumb? They got a one word vocabulary, woof. <laughs> so, imagine using only one word all the time. They sound dumb. I suppose. And you go ahead and ask me, I'll show you. No? Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. All right. All right. Irving, how's it going? Hello. <laughs> how's it going today? Hello. <clears throat> you get along with other dogs? Hello. <clears throat> how's the family? Hello. <clears throat> you like cats? Hello. <sighs> okay, that's enough. Hello. We've heard it. Hello. Listen, no. We'll talk about something else. Huh? You're drooling. So the old dude in the front row. <sighs> You apologize, Mr. I'm sorry. That's better, that you're drooling on the lady next to you. <laughs> oh, no, no. Well, listen, hey, these people came here to see a trained dog. Well, then you better go find one. <laughs> no, no, listen, when you found out you could talk, what's the first thing you did? Called Domino's, ordered a pizza. <laughs> How'd you pay for it? It didn't have to. The guy showed up. I said, how much will that be? He dropped a pizza and ran like the devil. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right, very good, all right. Well, you know, why don't we show everybody here how we train a dog? You know, it's all about practice and encouragement. You put together, it's love. Works for them, works for us. I'll show you. Treat your, teach a dog to sit, you say sit. And you gently push on their bottom, sit. And you say sit. That's the practice, now the encouragement. Good boy, good boy, good boy. Practice and encouragement. It's love. You just keep doing it over and over. Whether you're learning to play guitar, teach your dog. Irving, sit. <clears throat> sit. No. I said, sit, I don't care. <laughs> Irving, this is my act, then you sit. <sighs> Good boy. <laughs> well, the thing is, you just don't give up. We live in America, so you, want, you don't give up. All the dogs can learn, sit, sit. Sit, practice and encouragement. Good boy, good boy. You just keep doing it till we get it or they get it. It's all about love. Irving, sit. Very, very good. Very good. Now, what do you do? I do exercise. What do you do? Repetitions. Oh. Of what? Sitting. <laughs> Go ahead. Come on. Go ahead. One. Done. <laughs> good boy, good boy. A few years ago, myself and Hall of Fame songwriter Dennis Morgan wrote a song for Irving. It's called Man's Best Friend. And this is dedicated to all of your pets and all of your loved four-legged friends. Irving, can you sing? Now, now, go ahead. No, you go ahead. All right. All right. You can do it. Come on. I wake my tail every time I look at you. Right by your side, no matter what you do, I'm man's best friend. Good boy. Man's best 
friend. Well, you be my best friend too. Good boy. Keep going. Never a man, woman, and child. I'll make you smile. Give and joy to every girl and boy. That's what I do. And it's all for you. I promise you my whole life through. Stand by me. I'll stand by you. I man. Well, you be my best friend. I'll be your best friend too. I love you, Todd. I love you too. Give it up for Todd Oliver <laughs> and Irving. What a thrill. Hey, to see more of the hilarious Todd Oliver and read Irving's book, well, his dog blog, I guess it should say, because that's right, Irving actually blogs. Just go to Huckabee.tv for all the links. Right now, Keith, sit up and speak and tell us what can possibly Top this. You're crying. I'm not crying. I'm not crying. You're crying. Hey, well, uh, how about the winner of The Voice, Todd Tillman? He talks to Mike and performs his brand new single next on Huckabee. Huckabee next week for a Valentine's cake recipe with Stephanie Wise and country hit maker Craig Campbell performs. Tonight's musical guest has been singing in church since he was eight years old. America fell in love with this soulful blend of country, gospel, classic rock, and worship music, all in the same thing. And they made him the winner of the 18th season of The Voice. He's got a brand new single out. Listen to the name of this one. Dig My Grave. It's just been released. Please give a warm welcome to Todd Tillman. Todd, welcome. Thank you, man. It's good having you back. Yeah, I'm pleased to be here. You know, when I, when I saw the name of this song, I said, if that's not a country song, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Dig my grave. Yeah, yeah. You helped write this. I did, yeah. It's um, it's actually kind of got a really swampy country slant on a gospel message, man. Yeah. Uh, and I, I always like to joke everywhere I go and say, out of all the promises in the Bible, I think my least favorite is that we're going to die, you know? and uh, <laughs> Well, that's... But, you know, you know it's it is there. appointed unto man once to die. That's right, it's in there. Uh, but that's not it, man. If you got faith in Jesus, that's not it. And that's what this song's about. That's what I loved about it. When I first saw it, I thought, gee, that's a dark title, somber and kind of, kind of depressing. Yeah. But the song is not about so much that we die. No, 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 not at all. No, it's that we keep on living, man. We get eternal life. And when you hear it, you know it's not dark or somber at all. <laughs> and it's upbeat. That's what That's I right, love yeah. about it as well. You've got some great stuff going on. I want to go to another song. We're going to make it available on sure. our digital platform. And it's all about, really, you and your wife, and, and it's mm -hmm. kind of an autobiographical. You've got eight children. That's right, yeah. But eight. you started out living above her grandmother's garage That's in a right. little garage apartment. Yeah, our first place was was uh, just a little apartment over her grandmother's garage. And it's we call it one bedroom, but it's hard to even call it that. It was just rooms, <laughs> you know, a couple of rooms, and one of them had a bed in it. So. Well, you know, and, and I think one of the things that I love about your music, it's storytelling. Yeah, I love to tell stories. And that song, that, and we'll, we'll again tell our audience how to be able to listen to it as well, 
It's the story of your own life and marriage from living in a garage apartment to having eight kids and being on the road and being a a megastar in the music business. I don't know about megastar, but yeah. Well, I think you are. (laughs) Hey, you're on this show. You're a megastar. We only have megastars here. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what it's about. It's kind of a, um, actually, I, I, I don't have any with me right now. I'm sorry, I would give you one. And I know you would sport it if I gave it to you, but uh, I actually have shirts that don't say home wasn't built in a day, which is the title of the song, but they do say, don't despise small beginnings, because that's mm. what the song's about. You know, yeah. and that's the scripture, don't despise small beginnings. And so, Isn't that a great reminder, though, that yeah. what was just you and your wife starting out, but you had a dream right. that you would be able to make a living doing music. Yeah, and now you're living that dream. A lot of people never get to live their dream. That's right. Yeah, I'm blessed. 100% blessed. You know, um, what is the biggest challenge you? I mean, fathering eight children. I mean, that that alone, it's like are you building your own band? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> I'm trying to figure this out. You God. know, I really, it's I don't know what happened. We had a kid, and then well, let me explain how this works. Okay. More. Yeah. I think I can help you out a little bit, but I'll do it backstage after the show. Yeah, we'll talk about it in private. <laughs> That's right. But you obviously love your family. You yes, have a, a great relationship with your wife. Um, biggest joy for you? What is it? Oh, the biggest joy for me as as a dad is watching, because I've got children that are grown and getting either, either all the way grown or just yeah. about there. And it's getting to see them become who they are. But that was also sort of the biggest challenge because you want to sort of reach in and stop them. But God God really kind of spoke to us when we were young parents. I mean, there are boundaries and we had those things. Sure. But to let our kids be who they are, and that that was hard to do at times. But now, especially those ones of them that are coming into their own, you know, I'm really glad we did. I'm really glad we did. I see the joy in your expression and in your music. Yes, sir. So Keith, while we get set up, and get ready to make some music. I want you to tell the viewers how they can hear more of the great music of Todd Tillman. For links to Todd's music and more, visit Huckabee.tv. You can also watch an exclusive live performance of Home Wasn't Built in a Day. Now, performing his new single, Dig My Grave, with Trey Corley and the Music City Connection with Mike on bass, here's Todd Tillman. You can't live this day again The clock just keeps on spinning Everybody fears the end But a six foot hole in the clay Won't be enough to stand in my way You can be my way but I won't stay in it Don't cry. 